to the uh, January Programs and Policy Subcommittee of the Minneapolis Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And it will start with the announcement that this meeting may involve the remote participation by members, either by telephone or, or other electronic means due to the local public health emergency novel coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and this is pursuant to the provisions of Minnesota statute sections 13D.021. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we right off the bat, uh, the, we are we have a roll call agenda. I I hurdled past that last month. Are we are we doing roll call now, or are we 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 we? Millicent, are you copying people as they come in? I'm copying. I'm noting oh. people as they come in. Yeah, for okay. the for you, the uh, committees, we can skip that, Peter. All right, except terrific. Would, except yeah, I'd love to know who's here. Okay, we're, I can we're gonna we're gonna 14. do introductions as a part of the oh, first okay. agenda okay. too. So, oh, that's good. Okay, then we'll go right to that, and that's a, and we have introductions for new members with Matthew too. Sure. Exactly. So, um, the you know we have we have new members. Um, I haven't totally caught yet if all of them are on. I saw Matt, um, at least. Um, but also, uh, there's there's two others. So, our, um, our new members would have started and joined um, on the first meeting in January. Um, that was obviously canceled um, due to national situations. And um, and so we did have an engineering subcommittee, but we thought this was a good opportunity, you know, given the that it's the programs and policies and it's a little maybe a little more casual than engineering to do some introductions. Um, we're going to have a, a more robust introductions and orientation session um, in, in a week, so next Wednesday. But we wanted to just take this opportunity for everyone to sort of say hi um, and say what you represent. So we have a combination of appointed residents um, of the city and then staff and agency members. And so for those folks, please um, say kind of where you're from. Um, and uh, specifically, why don't we start with our our new members and then um, and then I guess I'll just go down the list. Maybe maybe we'll do it that way. But um, I saw Sarah, I saw Matt and is Christopher Chris Ross on? Yep, I, wait, maybe not. Um, but yeah, Matt, do you want to start and then Sarah? Sure. And welcome. Can, can everybody hear me? I actually am not sure if you yes. can see yes. me. It says my right. Right. Um, Yeah, my name's Matt. I, um, I'm a resident. I live in Whittier in South Minneapolis. And yeah, I'm excited to join. We're happy to have you. Yeah, Matt, welcome. 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 It's Sarah? Yeah. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah, also a resident. I live in Lynnhurst, so Southwest Minneapolis. Um, I work for Medtronic, been working from home for quite a while now. Uh, born and raised in Minneapolis, but lived in New York and Chicago for quite a while, and I'm an avid pedestrian, and I'm just really excited to, to be joining you guys and, and learn more about the work you do here. All right, welcome <laughs> Sarah as well. Uh, so I'll just read off then. So Abigail. Hi, I'm Abigail Johnson. I'm chair of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, and I'm trying to send an email right now to a member who's trying to join this meeting. So, oh. uh, but I welcome to the new members. It's so nice to meet you. And um, hey, Abigail. Hi, Jim. I, I found I found a phone number. Um, All right. There. Uh, <laughs> I, I I would like to say it would be good if we had our dial-in number in the agenda. I was really scrambling to find the dial-in number. Um, yeah. The, so. the dial-in oh. number for this particular the P um, the PMP meetings will remain the same. So if you note it down now, you can keep it for every month. Got it. I will do that. The, the same for every meeting. So there's just only three dial in numbers you'll have to remember, I think. Okay. And then it's the same um, meeting code. Yeah. So every INE has the same code and every full committee has the same code. So okay. you should be able to just mark them down and then reuse them. Yep. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> but it's. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Yes. Um, anyway, so I'm happy to meet the new members and I look forward to talking more with you at the full committee meeting when we have our full orientation in February. 
Lisa, um, not a PAC member, but one of our special guests today. Lisa Austin, do you want to say hi? Hello, I'm Lisa Austin. Uh, I work for MnDOT. I've been with MnDOT for about 12 years, and I work in the Center for Community Connections. So happy to be here today to share some information. Great, thanks. Welcome. Uh, Barb. Hi, I'm Barb Olson, and I'm a PAC member, and I live in southeast Minneapolis, close to Minnehaha Park, Kiwaden neighborhood. You're muted, Matthew. Matthew. Christopher Hofer, thanks. <laughs> Hi there, I'm uh, uh, Christopher Hofer. I live in the Warring Park neighborhood of Minneapolis. I'm a, a, a PAC member and the current uh, vice chair. Thanks, Millicent. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I am Millicent Flowers. I am an employee of Minneapolis Public Works. I work closely with Matthew and Chris on the BAC and the PAC. And um, welcome. Oh, oh crazy. Ah. Uh, and then the other um, member of our, our three team uh, staff staffing for the pack, uh, Chris Carthizer. Hi, Chris Carthizer. Um, I help staff the uh, pack with Matthew and Millicent. Uh, Steve. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, I'm um, agency rep for Metro Transit, and actually I sub for Sonia Brusset, um, who is the regular Metro Transit uh, rep on this committee. I, I did sit uh, as a regular agency rep for several years. Great group. Uh, good to see the new faces. Nice to see our, Nice to see everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Neil. Ah, here we are. Neil Baxter, uh, where do I live? Bancroft. Uh, Sarah, I grew up in Lindhurst. Where are you? Um, I am 51st in Penn. Nice, 51st in Aldrich. Other, right. side of, other side of Burroughs. That was the old Burroughs in those days. That's not relevant. <laughs> anyway, um, good to see you here. And yeah. Uh, yeah, great to have some new folks. And uh, I'm the secretary, if that's meaningful. It will be for me because I got to figure out what you're saying. but. Um, pleasure to meet everyone. I hope we have, uh, I hope we have, uh, what, do I, what do I hope? I hope everything's wonderful. All yeah. right. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, Paul, <laughs> I'll say Martin. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Paul St. Martin. I live in the downtown east area of St. Uh, Minneapolis, and uh, um, welcome to the committee. It's been uh, Committee's done some good work. I've been on the committee about two and a half years now, and uh, I really enjoy being part of the group. Great, thanks, Paul. Peter. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Matt. Uh, welcome. I'm Peter Vader, PAC member, co-chair of this uh, subcommittee with Julia Curran, uh, Programs and Policies. I live in uh, Deep South, HPDL, Hale Page, Diamond Lake, uh, almost uh, 59th and Elliott. And uh, welcome, look forward to working with you. All right, so Mike Samuelson, um, he's a uh, transportation planner in Public Works, um, also not on the committee, but one of our special guests uh, for an item. So Mike, do you want to say hi to the group? We have a couple new members, so we're just doing some introductions. Sure. Uh, Mike Samuelson, as Matthew said, I'm a transportation planner with Public Works. Uh, I'll be talking about our capital improvement program a little later on today. Uh, I'm also a resident of Minneapolis and live in the Seward neighborhood. Mm. Great. Uh, Ratana. Uh. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ratana Sengsli Chun. I'm a representative from the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development. Um, I'm a city planner, and I'm also a resident of Minneapolis. I live in the Cleveland neighborhood, and I think this is actually, I've been on the committee rep as a rep for about five years now. So. Great. Uh, McKinsey. I jumped in a little late here, so you guys just introducing yourselves. Yeah, so we have a couple okay. uh, new members, and so we're just kind of taking time to say hi. Sure, sounds good. So um, I'm Mackenzie Turner Bargain, and I am MnDOT's Metro District Pedestrian and Bicycle Coordinator. Um, I've been involved with this group in in various ways for a long, long time, but um, today I am joining you all just um, for Lisa Austin's presentation, which I oh. think. Um, is coming up a little later. So. Yep. 
Do you so, want the inside track? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. Thanks. McKinsey was also with Public Works for several years before current position. Just wanted to note that too. All right, did anybody else um, hop on? I think we have one person on the call, which I think is Julia Curran. Is that correct? Right. Or, or whoever is um, on the call, if you want to introduce yourself. Otherwise, we can. I think that was Jim Matthew, right? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. I, I'm I'm trying yeah. to help Julia get in right now. You're trying to help Julia. Okay. Yeah. Did anybody else hop on that got re sort of alphabetized? I don't think so. Hmm. Okay, well, great. Um, that good. concludes the introductions then. Uh, we'll look to next week, next Wednesday, for the full committee to dig a little deeper, get to know each other even a little bit more, and uh, do some more onboarding. So, welcome new folks. Uh, Peter, you are muted this time. Let me unmute myself. M thank you, Matthew. And uh, so next on the, the agenda uh, is uh, Lisa Austin from uh, MnDOT, Minnesota Department of Transportation, on the subject of non-highway uses uh, under bridges. Lisa, welcome and take it away. Thank, yeah, thank you so much. I'm uh, I'm really pleased to share this presentation. I've been shared it quite a few times in various places around the state, so it's nice to be able to share it again with this group. Um, before I get started, I, I just want to ask, is there anything in particular that you're working on that, that uh, prompted my invitation to this? It just might help me weave in some comments in the examples I'm going to show and some of the discussion. So uh, just to, to see, why did you invite me? <laughs> uh, I believe, and Abigail helped me out, I believe this is at the at the it was in the initiated by a previous pack member um and uh presented to us in the last couple couple of months and yes and where everybody was just like four square behind getting you here just to see about you know <laughs> just, just just it seemed like a, a, a natural part of our so much of our i mean i'll shut up a second but also much of our business is you know pedestrian crosswalks you know Cars, please don't kill us. You know, so when the so when this kind of uh, subject comes up to talk about activating new spaces for people walking and just on feet and everything else, it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a, it's great to mix in. So okay. I, I don't know if that completely describes it, but that was so right where I sort of where I sensed it. Nope, that's great. And yeah. it, you know, having it be just general information, that's great. If there was a particular project that was coming up that you were looking at, you know, I'd just make sure that I, you know, tried to relate some of the examples to, you know, your specific things. Somebody else was um, Julia here, Peter's co-chair for this committee. I was having um, issues signing in, but uh, both the previous member and myself and a lot of other PAC members have been concerned about some of the interactions with MnDOT, both um, underpasses and overpasses, and some of the ways the spaces are hostile, um, including the MnDOT's attitude towards people who use those spaces as um, housing or as shelter. So we've seen sort of an uptick in um, oh. criminalizing and kicking out, um, often the only eyes on the street in an area, people who just are looking for a space to be. So that's been a concern. And knowing that that tension around those spaces is something that um, comes up a fair amount. Okay. And that's yeah, driver behavior being more aggressive just okay. anywhere. Sure. Uh, most of my examples are going to be um, addressing sort of planned uses. Um, uh, certainly unplanned uses, whether they're uh, 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 groups uh, of people gathering or whether it's uh, people um, using the space for housing. Um, those I won't address so much today, but, you know, there's certainly things that MnDOT's talking about and, you know, I can take some of those questions back and, and find others that are maybe better at answering those uh, when we get to the end. But that's good to good to know that that's one of the concerns and questions this group has. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, uh, with that, I'll, unless there's something else anybody wants to add in context of uh, my coming here today, I'll go ahead and get started. Excellent. So um, just a little bit more about myself. So I work in the Center for Community Connections. It's a fairly new office at MnDOT. I myself have been with MnDOT for about 12 years and, and worked with Chris and Matthew on some things in the bicycle and pedestrian section. So it's nice to, to be back uh, 
working, you know, meeting, seeing you guys again and, and the rest of the committee. Um, the Center for Community Connections was set up to uh, work with communities for these kind of planned non highway uses of MnDOT right away. And they can be anything from a small pocket park all the way up to if you've heard the discussions about people interested in the Rondo Land Bridge, you know, so um, they can be a full, you know, full range, little tiny things all the way up to big things. And like I said, our office does work with groups all over the state. So we've got some good examples in, in smaller communities as well. Um, Everybody can see my screen, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay, great. So let's see. Hmm. All right, there we go. All right. I can all right. So first of all, I don't need to tell all of you that this is kind of a movement nationally, right? You know, uh, using public spaces for you know various uses. Uh, it's happening all over. Um, you're probably all familiar with the High Line network and the you know the High Line in New York City, where there was an abandoned rail line, elevated rail line that was turned into a park and. Um, the, the Highline Network kind of tries to illustrate examples all over the country. The Federal Highways has a, a, a community connections program and they've written a report which is pictured on this slide here. So Federal Highways has, you know, is recognizing these um, alternative non-highway uses. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Project for Public Spaces. So, you know, it's a movement here. It's not just Minnesota. It's not just MnDOT, but lots of people are talking about this kind of thing. Um, so first I'm going to share some underbridge examples in Minnesota. Um, the, the first few are the first few are up in Duluth under Highway 53 and I-35. And you can see the red dots here, the where the next few slides are going to be showing. 53 comes down the hill and it's elevated, and then it connects with I-35 here. And then there's another little bit uh, uh, farther west. Um, so the first example here is this Midtown Park, which is under Highway 53, and this was built in the 1970s. So you can see there's a skate park there, there's a basketball court, there was there was some horseshoe toss areas, and it's you know it's pretty well used. The kids in the neighborhood come and play in this area. Um, and then uh, a more a newer addition to this is closer down to I-35, where 53 hooks in the Cross City Trail passes under um, the the bridge there. And then farther to the west uh, is this area underneath 35. This trail kind of snakes underneath, but you can see then this whole uh, green area is a dog park and a, a recreation area underneath uh, these pieces of 35. Um, and I'll just go back to this uh, skate park. And this is an agreement between MnDOT and the city of Duluth. And in Duluth, the parks department is part of the city. So MnDOT has an agreement with the city of Duluth to have this park here. Uh, then um, this example is here in Wabasha. So this is, you can see on the map, it's uh, underneath a, a bridge that's going over the Mississippi. This is a fairly new bridge. So when the bridge was constructed, uh, they worked with the visual quality and created this plaza underneath the bridge. So you can see it's being used in this case. I think they called this September Fest. I don't know. Anyway, it's an event in the fall and you can see they're utilizing the space. The community is utilizing the space here. Um, they also have concerts under the park in this area. So this this is a concert series free every week and it's run by the nonprofit, the River Junction Arts Council. So um, that space is programmed by a nonprofit in, in Wabasha. Um, another uh, similar type bridge, it's uh, in Winona, you know, again, going over the Mississippi River. Um, this is in under Minnesota 43. And again, another nice plaza in this space, uh, right in the downtown area. Um, now, this one uh, is in Hopkins, we're back in the Twin Cities, and it goes under Minnesota 169 in Hopkins, and this was put in in 2000, so it's been around in, you know, for about 20 years. This is a lease with the city of Hopkins, and then the city of Hopkins has a sublease to the um, uh, first layer skate shop, so the skate shop um, manages the, the skate park. Uh, there's a little better picture of the the skating ramps, um, uh, skateboard ramps. So uh, that's 
right here in the Twin, Twin Cities and another use under 169. Here's another uh, bridge closer to the Twin, closer to Minneapolis. Uh, the the picture's cutting off the title there, but that's in Hastings under Minnesota 61. And again, a little newer bridge. And this has got, it's kind of in the shadows there, but there's a mural on the wall and then some seating and, you know, an attractive plaza area under the Hastings Bridge. So the next uh, example I'm going to talk about is a proposal. So we don't know for sure if this will be built or not, but right now we're in the negotiation phase for a new use of the space underneath I-94 as it comes into Minneapolis. You guys may be very familiar with this, but uh, or you may not, so I'll just show it. So right now it's a parking lot um, uh, next to Target Field and behind Ramp C. And the developer um, is proposing to put in a uh, public green space. So this, these glass windows you can see towards the top of the picture, that's a new construction that's not built yet. So this developer is building this big office tower and apartments and condos and I don't know what all, you know, mixed use kind of uh, development. And uh, they, they're proposing to have a lease with MnDOT to turn that parking area into public open space um, where, you know, you can see there there's the concert going on, you know, they can program activities, but um, they would leave it open to the public even though it's uh, um, built and managed by the private developer. And again, that would be a lease between MnDOT and this developer if it goes through. Um, another project that's in the proposal phases. So again, we don't know for sure this will get built, but we're negotiating this is underneath the Skyway between ramps B and C on 2nd Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. Um, uh, this little, you know, you can see 394 is uh, trenched, but up on the street level, there's a, a little parcel of land underneath the Skyway that is managed by MnDOT. And uh, there's a proposal for a skate park. So the Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board has put this area in their skate park plan. So they're hoping to be able to negotiate an agreement with MnDOT to put the skate park in there. They are working with uh, uh, a nonprofit. Oh, I don't have the picture of that. Anyway, they're working with um, the uh, Min Midwest Skateboard Alliance to put that in. So the Midwest Skateboard Alliance would do all the fundraising to raise money to build the park and then gift the park to the Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board to manage it as a park over the long term. Um, so you can see here some concept drawings. They've got some better ones on their website now if you want to see the kind of thing that they're proposing. But that's a you know another kind of activated space um, area. They're talking about skate park area and then some seating for um, the public to use. So those are some examples of things we've done in Minnesota. And now I have some examples around the rest of the country. Um, first of all, there's an interesting project up in Toronto um, under the Gardner Highway. And this, uh, they call it the Bentway. And it's a pretty extensive project. Um, and some interesting things about that are the the um, there's a, a government authority that consists of the city of Toronto, the province of Ontario, and then can, the Canadian government. So it's a three-way government authority that kind of manages the negotiations between the three government entities. And they there's a bunch of waterfront development and some other um, you know things happening in this area. And one of the things they negotiate is this, you know, one of the things they manage is this uh, space underneath the highway. And so the Bentway Conservancy, Conservancy is a nonprofit that is hired to um, maintain and program and, you know, activate this space underneath the uh, the Bentway Highway, the, Gar the Gardner Highway in, in Toronto. I don't have any pictures here, but if you, you know, Google this, you'll see all kinds of, you know, they've got ice skating in the winter and, you know, it's a similar northern climate to us. So it's kind of neat to see the, the summer and winter activities they have uh, in that space. Um, 
So another example underneath an elevated transportation facility is the underline in Miami. Um, not as much of this is built. There's a lot of concepts for it. I think there's some small sections that are already built. This is actually an elevated train line, but you know it's still using that sort of under bridge space for activation. Um, and then another example is in Boston under I-93. And this is, again, another uh, partnership with a developer. So the developer built some, you know, some new complex next to the highway and wanted it, wanted the space to be used for many things, one of which is parking. So they've, um, you know, you can see the, the developers managing the parking area where they actually charge for parking. Uh, but they're they're also then using that those parking spaces for other activities when there's not a high demand for parking. And I don't know what their demand is, but let's say it's on weekends, they don't need the parking. So then they have events on the weekends, really using that space to the fullest, you know, concerts. They've got, I guess they have donut fest and then you see exercise classes. So um, lots of activities under this. They also do a lot of public art um, events under under this area. Uh, if you Google it, you can see all kinds of videos and schedules for all the things they do under this bridge. Um, lots of public art. And then it, they were also able to incorporate some public spaces. And uh, this, this boardwalk here actually helps connect um, some of the areas to transit facilities. So uh, part of the development helped connect, connect some transit hubs that were hard to get to under the bridge. Uh, and then in New Orleans, there's an area called there's the the cultural innovation district, and you know, you know similar to a lot of highways around the country, and certainly in Minnesota, you know there was a, a you know this oak, this promenade here was this you know facility that was ripped out to put in a highway in 1972, kind of destroyed a historically black neighborhood and. You know, now what they're doing is going in and trying to activate the spaces under the highway to help reconnect uh, the two sides. Um, since it was elevated and not trenched, you know, this is the way they're um, trying to make some improvements in the connectivity between the two neighborhoods that were divided. And then in Houston, there's this Sabine Promenade. And again, this was newer construction, but they built the uh, uh, path under there and have some nice landscaping. In Atlanta, they've got the facility called the Beltline, and this is a, a pedestrian and bicycle route that goes all around the city, and there's sections of the Beltline then that go underneath some of the highways. So there's pieces of the Beltline that are under the highway. You can see there's public art and a wider facility, you know, wider pedestrian and bicycle facility and, you know, better lighting and, you know, activating that space. Um, so those are those are all my examples and uh, you'll have this presentation and here's links to a lot of the things I've talked about here if you want to look uh, up anything uh, in more detail. And here, sorry. Um, I guess as I end, uh, a couple of really important things to keep in mind are, you know, none, no two of these things are the same. You heard me reference this was an agreement with uh, a city directly, a local government, or the, another one might have been a lease with a developer. Another one might have been a, uh, a local government then had a sub agreement with um, either a nonprofit or a business. And so they're they're all different and they've all been funded in different ways. The maintenance agreements are completely different. I mean, there's just no nothing, you know, there's no two of them that are the same. So obviously when you're when you're doing things uniquely each time, early coordination is really important. So uh, you know, I would encourage any anybody that starts thinking of an idea, you know, you know reach out to Mackenzie or myself or you know, if it's a MnDOT facility, make sure that we're at the table from the very beginning because it can, you know, we can help think of examples or ways things have been done in other places. Um, obviously, if it's a county or a city facility, you know, whoever the um, owner of the bridge is, you know, it, it just helps to be in, involved from day one. Um, and then the next couple slides, I won't go into details on these. You'll have these as as uh, examples, but this slide, you know, talks about ownership and management. It's like, you know, like I said, sometimes it was with the local government, sometimes it's direct with a developer, sometimes it's with a government authority. 
um, you know, different, there's different goals. And when you think about the purpose and goals for why you're using space under a bridge, that can lead into the different types of agreements, the different funding sources you may be able to find. So, you know, in that ink block park, part of what they wanted was to have some revenue from parking so that they could use the money from the parking to program the space. So they needed revenue to be able to, you know, do some of the public art. And so this was kind of a self-funded way of doing it. So, um, you know, depending on what your goals are kind of defines what you're doing. Um, uh, funding scenarios, you know, there's a zillion ways to get funding. You know, in the bent way that, that uh, Toronto example, it started off with a 25 million donation from a wealthy individual. So <laughs> uh, uh, these things can be funded in lots of ways. Um, uh, and then programming, you know, mentioned that River Arts Council in Wabasha, you know, that's a, an arts organization or the third layer skate shop doing the skate park. So lots of different ways to program spaces. Uh, and that's that's my slides. So I'm happy to answer any questions and hopefully I'm sticking to our timeline here. I know you guys have a lot on your agenda today, so. Yeah, great, Lisa. Thank you. Um, and we do. Yeah, we certainly do have time for questions now. Um, and um, is there a hand up? There is a <laughs> hand from Matthew. Excellent. Hey, Lisa. Thanks. This hey. is fantastic. Um, I, I have a question with the with the private development example um, in Minneapolis. Is there a, a I guess a guarantee in the agreement uh, that that space will will be public um, and not be I guess restricted or seen as a private space right and that you know that's a that's a uh i won't first i'll just talk about private spaces in general i mean we see that as a trend nationally that you know that um you know privatizing some of these public spaces whether it's a you know a building that has a plaza in front they allow the public to use it it is their space though to to manage so um the under the expectation here is that it is public but it is also managed by a private entity so i imagine you know they would have you know they're not they're going to be calling their own security guards out or they're going to be you know um managing you know if there's a private event they'll be the ones um roping it off for that private, you know, if there's a wedding or there's something else like that. So I'm not sure what the details are particularly in this lease, but, you know, that's, I'm sure it'll face the same kind of challenges as, um, you know, any of these other privatized public spaces. The other thing to keep in mind with that Heinz example is they actually own the land. So the, the highway, the highway um, is an easement over their land. So it's not as much it's not a, the same as when MnDOT or the state owns the land and then we're leasing it out. So yeah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. But there, I know their intent is to have it be open for the public. You know, they want it to be an amenity that isn't just gated off for their residents only. It's meant to be a public space. Um, Peter, I saw Julia's hand and. I think oh, okay. For yeah, just see you there. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, uh, Julia and Neil after that, I guess. I've got a couple of questions. I guess I'm most interested in how these spaces function, um, already existing ones, particularly in areas that are uh, pretty walkable or have a lot of people around them, um, and what the default amenities would be, What the why there's spaces that are getting much more hostile, um, how that happens, and what what MnDOT has in place as programs for every underpass that goes in, particularly in um, like the 35W um, project along Lake Street uh, seems to be really, really terrible um, so far. And a lot of the examples you shared looked very different in terms of the built structure that it starts with the height. Um, what's what sort of the everyday gritty level uh, implementation and guidelines? So I'll just say, first of all, every one of these is different. So, you know, somebody comes to us with a proposal, whether it's a, another local government or whether it's a developer and we, you know, hash out what the use is, whether we can use it, um, you know, and MnDOT's not the final decision maker. The Department of Admin looks at it and Federal Highways then approves it. So, you know, it's, it's a, like I said, a lot of coordination. Um, I'm not familiar with 
what's happening in, in the 35 example that you're talking about. So I don't know the I, I don't know the issues with that. And I really, quite frankly, I haven't been involved with you know, with any of the unplanned uses, I'm certainly aware that that's been uh, things some of my colleagues have been working on. So, it, it, you know, I can I can try to find out if there's somebody that can come address some of those questions. I mean, that's certainly an issue that the whole country is facing, you know, finding space for people experiencing homelessness. And, you know, I, I, I myself have not been involved in, in any of that work, so. Have you seen any of that, um, any efforts around that since these are environments that um, sometimes there might be reasons to try to do housing um, in these areas anyhow? Have you seen that as any of the projects? Not the projects that I've come up with that, you know, that's... Uh, it, so, so if somebody came to us with a proposal, you know, like if there's a a, a, a local government or a, 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 a service provider that came with a proposal, you know, we would run it through the same, um, you know, channels that we do any of the rest of these things. So I, we're not proactively going out trying to plan spaces. We, the our office was set up to respond to requests. So That's I haven't seen anyone, you know, request to uh, in Minnesota have um, some, you know, planned housing on space, if that makes sense. I, you know, I know there's been some housing on public right away and, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, yurts being built, you know, for, you know, as temporary housing and allowing people, to, but I have not seen any proposal like that come to us. So, um, who would we talk to to find out more about that? Since that's something that I think comes up a, a lot, um, sort of the tension between the unofficial uses from people in need versus people who are against those. That, um, and then who we would talk to about sort of the standards that go in with every bridge, with every bridge renovation of um, for the, the pedestrian experience. If you don't know offhand, I can- Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit. So I think unofficial uses are always a challenge because you wanna make sure that everybody's safe right whether it's the people that are experiencing homelessness is it a safe places for them to be are there facilities for them are there services or or is it a safe place for someone to to, to use their skateboard you know people you know you know are they going to get hurt are they is it a place where they're going to go flying off into traffic or you know so any use that's unplanned has its risks and so um it seems like there's more policing of that and the policing seems to somehow be in response. It's not uniform and it isn't a default that happens. And it generally makes the spaces, at least in my experience, in my view, it makes them more hostile to walking. So I'm curious, like when we see all of a sudden there's five signs and the people that I, you know, my neighbors are no longer there and I have no idea what happened to them. Um, on Lindale, for example, between um, uptown and downtown, that, that, MnDOT was responding to something, or there's a huge fence that went up near Cedar Riverside, and the people that I used to say hi to there are not there. And I, you know, there's a displacement happening, but not uniformly. And I'm curious what what structures are happening there. And if it, this might be getting, I want to make sure that people have yeah, an answer. I, I, I mean, I guess I jump in for a second, Julia. It does. It seems to be a little bit of a tangent. I don't. I don't know if it's the right question for for Lisa necessarily. Um, right. I think she, she kind of answered, it seems like more like they, they deal with a little bit like kind of react to requests. And I know there's a lot of, this is obviously a big topic, especially yeah. in Minneapolis, but but it's, may, it's maybe not the focus of, of this right no, now. No, I understand. I was just curious um, where- But, but I, 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 did, I did hear Lisa say that like, that if that sort of request was brought forward, it could be something that would be considered. So like that might just be something to think about in in, in other venues, but I, I don't want to put too much pressure on Lisa to answer th questions about policing or- Right, I'm not, I'm just, yeah. or, well, or maybe, maybe this will help a little. Thanks, Chris, I appreciate it. And this, 
so for example, um, there's a we've had a proposal to provide or to allow uh, and I, I don't know if it's the DID or if it's some um, service provider, but I know DID is helping arrange this. So we've had a proposal to provide a space for lockers for people experiencing homelessness in parking ramp B. So there and that my understanding is that's going forward. I don't know if the lease has been finally signed. They may be still be negotiating some different things, but the service provider is going to come in and manage this space and you know have set hours they're gonna you know make sure that you know it, it's safe for everybody you know that people come in there that the people's things are safe i mean we don't have staff to manage the lockers so we're going to have a lease to allow somebody to manage this locker so um you know i think that if someone comes to us with a with a proposal to manage something safely we would consider it like we would consider anything. So I don't, you know, I've seen how we've responded to the request for the lockers for people experiencing homelessness. And that's a critical need. I mean, if you if you live in a shelter and you go to a job during the day, you know, you can't leave your stuff in the shelter. You can't take your big backpack to your job. So you need a place to safe place to leave it. So, um, you know, that's a case where, you know, we were able to, uh, allow that use and so i don't you know i don't i haven't seen the hostile responses in the work i do so um you know if somebody has a good proposal for how to have activities on our right away that's safe for everybody i think we would you know entertain that proposal does that make sense yeah and i i realize i didn't mean to take us so far off yeah, down no. that. <laughs> later just to follow up but thank you I know other people had questions. Okay. Neil, did you have something? Was that? Uh, uh, no, that? I must have been waving my hand around. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, um, then uh, I'm looking for any other hands. I don't see any. Um, I want to thank Lisa for uh, for being here today, and we really appreciate the time and the great presentation. There's a lot of really great ideas around the country, and. Um, can I give, ask one last question about winter? What, what happens to the third layers operation Hopkins in the winter time? Is it open all, oh. is it open all year? Or <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know that one. I, okay. I, all right. We could probably go to their website and look to see if they've closed it down for the winter or if they're able to keep that clear. I do know that up in Duluth, you know, that's, you know, a park that's operate, you know, this, that the city of Duluth just monitors. And so that one doesn't have gates around it. And, you know, when there's no snow, kids are still using it. So, you know, under sure. those bridge spaces, I think some of those um, recreational areas uh, can be used year round when there's not too much snow. Sure. Hence the, the hardcore. Thank <laughs> you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Next up on the agenda is uh, we have the CIP and Mike, Mike Samuel sent us here for them. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm, as I said in the beginning, my name is Mike Samuelson. I'm a transportation planner with Public Works. Uh, I've got a brief presentation that talks on the CIP, which, uh, again, I know we've got a mix of some new members and some people who were on the presentation last year. Um, so for some of you, this might be a little bit repetitive. Uh, I know in the past that there's been a request to make the presentations pretty brief to allow for as much time for discussion as possible. So I'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly. Um, there's, you know, certainly have time to answer questions. Uh, and of course, if, if you don't get to a question or if you think of something later, uh, you're always welcome to email me. Uh, email is first name dot last name at Minneapolis min dot gov. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And again, I'm going to try and go through this quickly. Uh, apologies if it's too quick, but um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can answer any questions that people feel like aren't uh, fully explained when we get to discussion. So uh, can everyone see my screen? Can I just get someone to give a quick uh, yes? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so just an overview of the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to talk through a little bit of the background on capital programming in the city of Minneapolis. I'm going to give a brief update on the CIP that was just passed in the most recent budget. Uh, so our CIP is a six-year process. So the most recent CIP 
uh, was 2021 to 2026. The one that we're starting to work on now uh, that will go to council for the budget uh, is 2022 to 2027. Uh, then I'm going to go over some of our biking, walking, and safety programs and projects, and then hopefully we'll have most of our time for questions and discussion. So capital programming, it's really an annual process, uh, as this chart kind of illustrates. Uh, it was particularly challenging last year with just everyone's schedule being disrupted uh, with COVID. Um, so, I, you know, I'll just note that we, we typically start the process in the fall. Uh, and start identifying and evaluating potential projects, things to add and update. Uh, this year is particularly eventful as we knew that TAP was going to be, uh, the Transportation Action Plan was going to be passed. And so looking at how we can potentially update our capital planning to better reflect what's in the TAP. Uh, and so at this point, uh, kind of quarter one, we're, we're preparing capital, uh, what we call CBRs, capital budget requests. Um, which are basically sort of the, the definition of how much money is going to each project and program, what do those projects and programs cover. Uh, then we can go to CLIC, which is a citizen review commission, uh, which we present to them. They make recommendations uh, to the mayor later in the summer, and then everything goes to council for markup and adoption at the end of the year. Uh, the 20 year streets funding plan was passed uh, a few years ago. It provides some general uh, guidance on how we select projects. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. We could give a whole presentation on the 20 year streets funding plan. Um, I just want to note that it's out there. It's a city ordinance and it, it uh, provides a lot of guidance and rules about how we do our work. Uh, other plans and policy guidance that we uh, that we draw from. Um, I've got a few listed up here that the 2040 comprehensive plan, uh, the tap which was just passed, uh, the vision zero action plan, uh, there's many, many more that, you know, again, we could just list off this and, and probably take 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I just want to note again that there's a lot of uh, city guidance that, that we use as we develop our capital programming. Um, so just a, a note before we get into the specific biking and walking programs and projects, um, and, and I'll just say for folks who are new, uh, when I say program, I'm referring to something that is funded every year in our CIP. So uh, a good example of this is our uh, uh, Safe Routes to School program. So every year we allot a certain amount of money to that program and then there are individual projects that are kind of nested within that program. And then we have uh, kind of one-off projects. Uh, so like a street reconstruction project uh, is a good example of that. So take downtown, uh, Hennepin Avenue downtown, which is under construction now. So that's kind of a one-off project where we we take a chunk of money uh, and we we put it to that uh, for a year or two. Uh, but then, you know, once that project is done, uh, you know, that money is kind of freed up for future years. So uh, what this slide is just showing is that with our larger street reconstruction projects, uh, they make up a, a large chunk of our budget. Uh, you can see in the recently passed six years CIP, it was about $330 million uh, put into these reconstruction projects. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times there's perception that those are just paving projects uh, or signal projects. But, uh, you know, in addition to the paving elements, we also include sidewalks, bump outs, ADA improvements. Um, you know, we're now looking at adding a lot more green infrastructure as part of those projects. So there's, there's a lot of um, different types of improvements and benefits we see from our street reconstruction projects. And then uh, just noting at the top of this slide, again, you can see that, uh, again, over the six year process, there's about $13 million uh, beyond beyond the street reconstruction projects, which was set aside specifically for bike ped projects and about 46 million that was set aside specifically for bike ped programs. And so this slide is uh, showing something Pretty similar. <clears throat> uh, the difference here is this is calling out bicycle infrastructure. So you can see of those uh, street reconstruction projects, uh, about two thirds of the budget uh, of those projects include some type of bicycle facility. I know this is the PAC, but we often uh, also get questions about bikes. Uh, and so that equates to about 16 miles of bicycle facilities in those street reconstruction projects. Uh, shown here, across the full CIP, uh, approximately how many uh, miles of 
new pedestrian facilities we're looking at uh, and new bicycle facilities and we kind of broke those down by those reconstruction projects the standalone bike bed projects uh, and the bike bed programs so just a quick note about the the budget that was just adopted um, the recommended funding levels uh, that public works had for uh, for the, the 2021 to 2026 CIP were adopted by council. Um, there were some uh, some larger reconstruction projects uh, at kind of the back end of our CIP, which ended up getting cut uh, by the mayor and by council. And probably the, the biggest change was that the CIP included a new Vision Zero program starting this year in 2021 uh, and then extending through the life of the CIP. And um, well, actually just get into that program right now. So uh, what that program does, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Vision Zero Action Plan, which identified high injury streets across the city. And so this program uh, put aside some funding, a uh, million dollars in the, the first couple of years and then half a million thereafter um, to make improvements on these high injury streets to improve traffic safety for people walking, biking, taking transit and driving. Uh, and so you can see the, the map of those city controlled high injury streets um, and we're anticipating getting uh, these improvements in over the next few years. And so just stepping through some of our other bike ped programs, uh, we've got our defective, uh, defective hazardous sidewalk program so essentially the city has a few different sidewalk inspectors. They choose a few different neighborhoods each year. Uh, so you can see uh, the map on the right, the, the neighborhoods that are uh, up for this year and then uh, the rest of the years in the CIP. Uh, so those inspectors inspect sidewalks and then uh, city crews come in later and replace defective panels. Uh, we also have our sidewalk gap program. So this is typically adjacent to city parks uh, or other you know, institutional land um, where there just isn't any sidewalk present right now. Uh, so 2021, uh, the project is Farview Park in North Minneapolis. We're on the east side, there's currently no sidewalk. And so uh, this program will come in and, and build sidewalk where none exists right now. Uh, our protected bikeway program uh, obviously builds protected bikeways. Uh, so oftentimes there are also pedestrian benefits that we see as part of these protected bikeways. Uh, the photo in the bottom left is uh, Emerson in North Minneapolis, and you can see in addition to the protected bikeway, uh, there's also a pedestrian refuge island uh, to help shorten the crossing there. So we do see some pedestrian benefits on these projects as well. Uh, Safe routes to school, making it uh, safer and easier for students to bike and walk to school. Um, this year we have a project in uh, Whittier, uh, so that's going forward for construction in 2021. And then we've highlighted projects uh, on the map you can see on the right. Uh, the, the next project is actually a project that we won some federal funding on, uh, which is 16th Avenue North in North Minneapolis. And these projects typically have a, a combination of um, pedestrian improvements, traffic calming treatments, Sometimes there'll be a short section of bikeway. Uh, it's really sort of contingent on the local needs uh, and discussions with students and faculty and, and parents at the school. Uh, our pedestrian safety program typically targets uh, unsignalized intersections uh, where there's a history of pedestrian crashes and there's no other future uh, projects coming up. Um, this is a program where we've actually bumped up the funding in, in uh, the most recent CIP. Um, so we previously had funded this at $600,000 a year. Uh, it's being bumped up starting in 2022 to a million dollars a year and thereafter. So we should be seeing uh, more of these types of intersection improvements going forward with that additional funding. And then just I'm going to highlight a, a couple of the standalone projects that we have. So the two are going forward this year. Uh, we have uh, on the left just a map showing in the Midtown Greenway uh, portion that's being resurfaced. So that's from Fifth Avenue to the western edge of the city. 
and then the Queen Avenue Bicycle Boulevard project, which includes a lot of traffic calming treatments and, excuse me, crossings at major intersections. That's also uh, construction is starting this year. And then next year we have another trail gap project uh, on 18th Avenue Northeast, just a couple blocks from California to Marshall. And then scheduled uh, for 2026 is the phase one of the North Side Greenway. Uh, I know Matthew's been working on this for, for quite a while. I'm sure this group's heard about it and, and probably um, contributed in many ways. Um, so we were finally able to get that programmed into our CIP, uh, the phase one of that project. So uh, that's the presentation. I know, uh, like I said, I, I tried to go through that quickly to save some time. Um, so I'll just keep my slides shared. And if we need to go back to a particular page, uh, we can certainly do that to talk through anything. And with that, I will uh, actually, one thing before I open up to questions or comments, um, Matthew, Chris, and I have talked about doing sort of two sets of presentations. So this one is informational and then getting uh, questions, comments from you that we can incorporate into the, the latest round of the CIP. And then the, um, the, the comments that we get, we will um, take those under consideration and then I'll be coming back in uh, a month or two to present what is our uh, recommended capital program uh, that we're gonna be taking to click later this spring. So uh, with that, I will stop talking and open it up to questions and comments. Uh, thanks, Mike. That was a uh, well done, real concise. Uh, so I'm looking for hands up for questions. Um, and I'm seeing some active microphones, but not any hands up. Is anybody else seeing any hands up? Maybe I'm not seeing them. Uh, but we are open for questions for whoever wants to jump in. I see Paul St. Martin has got his hand up. Thank you. I, I, my screen is, is hey, go ahead, Paul. Uh, hi, Mike. Um, good presentation. I have a quick question. So on all your capital projects, um, you're adding a lot of uh, bike and pad infrastructure. And I'm wondering, do you automatically then budget uh, additional operating money for uh, maintenance of those items? For example, we just saw at our previous uh, meeting a proposal to do work on Bryan Avenue and build an off street you know, bike facility on that street, which will need to be plowed and maintained as a city then automatically add funding to the cap or the operating budget to maintain those those type of facilities? Yeah, good question. Um, I will preface this by saying I am I am not an expert on the operating side of the budget. I, my focus is the capital. Um, my understanding is that there have been some increases in funding for operating, um, but I know that, for instance, there is also some reduction in, in funding for operating last year due to COVID. So I wonder if Matthew uh, or Chris, if, if you have anything else to share on that one. Um, I'll say I, I'm not sure fully um, with the reduction um, due to the budget, but typically um, I'll just say with with protected bikeways, at least that's that's one thing that we've um, started to pair with uh, annual. Like as we increase the protected bikeway network, we'll increase the operating costs to cover those miles. Um, other other pieces of ped bike maintenance i don't i don't have a lot more to add okay and one other thing i wanted to note so so mike mentioned that you know this is presentation one and there will be another presentation he'll come back and sort of present some more information um, i also want to note that we plan to have sort of in between some working time um, for the committees to um, hmm. have your own time to think about recommendations um, and things that you'd like to um, like for us to include. So I just want to note that uh, don't feel pressure or don't um, don't feel the need to get everything uh, out today. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> um, and um, who else? I'm not sure my screen is is uh, faithfully showing hands up. I'm not seeing anybody, if any, any other hands up. Um, I was uh, I was curious if the Midtown Greenway was getting other, any, was it strict resurfacing, any other, any changes to the alignment or separation of pedestrians and bikes? We, we've had a lot of discussion about if there are opportunities to further separate peds and bikes and um, 
in most cases, the answer is no for a couple reasons. Um, one is the historic nature of the corridor. There's a lot of historic bridges um, that have you know large pylons um, that kind of constrain the space. Um, sure. And that. And then there's also uh, the need to, so the, the agency that actually owns that space, uh, which is part of the county, um, they're preserving the space for transit. And so while there's, you know, some additional kind of, you know, unused space or unpaved space uh, in the trench in particular, um, that space is, is kind of being preserved for future transit use. I know that this project is looking at making some improvements at some of the uh, access points. Uh, I don't have a lot of detail on the specifics of that, but we can look into that and uh, send it to Matthew to to send out to the, the group. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not seeing any other hands up, but just so, uh, if we're, if we're going to wrap up with you, Mike, and thank you for being here. Is there anything um, from our standpoint that the PAC can uh, can can do for your process or your your side of things? So we wrap up. You know, I, th I think what's most helpful for us is just hearing about recommendations um, of specific projects, whether it's intersections where you'd like to see improvements or, um, you know, bike lanes, uh, corridors where, you, where you'd like to see connections. That kind of thing is really helpful for us. We have, you know, a lot of data driven processes and we have our own perspectives from traveling around the city, um, but obviously everyone knows their neighborhood and their routes uh, the best. And so if there are you know specific intersections that you feel like could use pedestrian improvements and, and you're not seeing them within our CIP, uh, just providing that detail to us for us to take into consideration is really helpful. Well, terrific, Mike. Uh, thank you for uh, for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Moving right along, um, we have um, PAC survey results with Julia Curran and Chris Kurtheiser. Yeah, um, thanks for having me on. And Julia and I uh, spoke about this, so Julia, um, uh, as we talked about, feel free to jump in wherever and however you'd like with, with anything. Basically, um, so first of all, thanks everyone for um, taking the survey. We had really good response we had 12 pack members and nine agency reps respond which i thought was um really good like 21 um in total which is the vast majority of people um the vast majority of voting members and then a lot of good agency rep um response as well so what i'm going to do today is just um kind of talk through some of the results i i don't have a succinct handout um from survey monkey so i so i didn't put anything online julie and i did talk through the results and um i i'm, I'm happy to kind of share stuff i for maybe the next like full meeting if people want to dig into this at all on their own after hearing this um frankly it's it's not too complex in in most cases um but but i am happy to to share that so i'll i'll just get right in feel free to jump in if you have a question um there's just a, a few things that i'm going to kind of pull out as potential questions for the group or things to change um, based on what I saw. But if any of you have an idea or say, oh, this wasn't working or like something else comes to mind that you didn't put in the survey, feel free um, to bring that up. I, I think today is more conversational. Um, we're not going to make any decisions today to, to like, let's say, change a meeting to a different time or day or like change a style. But I think what we can do is um, get an idea of how things are working, um, maybe get see if this group is on the same page for anything, and then kind of make a proposal to bring to the full group if there's um, if there is a, a change that we want to try and implement. Um, any other context, Julia? Oh yeah, go ahead. Just for anyone who doesn't remember, we basically were doing the survey trying to um, a couple of months into into the pandemic, trying to figure out um, how meetings are working now that they're in such a different style and it's also lining up with um, new members coming on board so wanting to make sure that we know what's working what isn't and we would want to do a follow-up if and when we can be meeting in person again so that's sort of that was the impetus for it 
Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, so I'll, I'll just get into it. So the first question was, how do our meeting times or days of the week work for you? And I just left it open ended just to see if people came up with anything interesting. The um, the word cloud that I made on this, the biggest word was fine. <laughs> so so ah. the, the vast majority of people just think this works. Um, I'll show my own bias a little bit in that like we've tried to figure out if we should change days or times um, before and it it often ends up being harder to do that and people have already kind of made it made this work with their schedule but i do think it's good to ask every once in a while so for the most part um that here or there there might have been um some challenges unfortunately for our mprv staff people folks they have a board meeting on wednesdays but um that's uh there, there weren't a, a lot of uh conflicts conflicts that we saw Length of the meetings was a similar type of thing of generally what's working is good. Um, there was a little bit of flexibility of like every once in a while, two hours feels too long. Um, at the same time, some of the people who said two hours is too long noted that sometimes two hours is still not enough to really get through like a packed INE agenda or something like that. So it's it seems like we're we're pretty well hitting this sweet spot with that um noting that sometimes the agendas are just packed and and it can be a little bit hard to get through stuff um the one thing so julie and i spoke a little bit about this um it's, it seems like the meeting times generally generally work for folks it seems like the meeting length generally works for folks about an hour and a half to two hours max um, one thing that we discussed, and I'll just put it out for a little bit of open discussion right now. Again, we don't have to make any decision today or anything. Uh, kind of two things that are paired together a little bit. So one of them um, is is online, since things have tended to take a little more time, is kind of setting our meeting time to two hours as more of kind of this, I don't want to say standard, but like, acknowledging that it's it's we're going to have more two hour meetings and or that we're allowed our help ourselves to have two hour meetings and then anytime we don't have an agenda fill that to fill that then go to an hour and a half so basically like this meeting would be scheduled today from 4 30 to 6 30 but we would not like work hard to fill that if we aren't able to fill that last half hour it's just something that would be there um, if we need it just to kind of set that standard um, so that that was one piece. Just wanted to get people's reaction to that generally. And then the, the other piece that's kind of combined with it, and then Julie, I'll let you in, um, is, is to potentially standardize our meeting time. So right now, I, I think the full starts at 4 o'clock, and then our subcommittees start at 4.30, which just for the sake of um, standardization, having them all at the same time so people don't kind of forget which one it is. And then also, if we are going to do the two hour thing, I've heard at least a couple people and this more anecdotally, not from the survey, say that um, after six, it gets a little harder. I think the, the one person that I know for sure I've heard that from um, has kids and dinner time gets a little harder. I know I, not everyone's dealing with that, um, but just wanted to throw out those two things. And Julia, <laughs> if you have anything to add and then other people, if you have reactions. To clarify on the two hour thing it's not the idea is just basically instead of the reality being that we have one and a half hour meetings going long we would be trying to have two hour meetings that often go short so that it doesn't feel like you're being kept over but you're getting out early um just as a way of thinking about and framing the time <laughs> a morale boost I'm trying to trick you all into longer meetings even though i would do that if i could i really enjoy them but christopher not, oh <laughs> Like nothing would change in what we do. I don't. I just like to point out a little bit tongue in cheek, but um, never has the time allotted for a meeting ever. Meetings grow to the time allotted. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 what's going to happen. Um, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, at least scheduling for 90 minutes and going a bit long makes it, um, I think, more extraordinary than having it two hours and, hey, we can leave, you know, 10 minutes early. If we need the two hours because of um, uh, routinely, because that's what we're scheduling for, then it should be two hours. But um, I think it will necessarily fill with 
there's less um maybe there's more chit chat maybe i mean there's those kind of things not necessarily bad but it will fill it will fill to take two hours and that's just my gut feeling mm -hmm. i i appreciate that point um i i do think it it, it definitely has uh merit i i with the engineering committee maybe less so because i think in certain months we just it's not a matter of feeling it's just how many things are coming down <laughs> the pike at one time and then it it just is two hours worth but i especially hear you for the for the this hub committee um and i and i'll i guess i'll just ask you if you think that's a bad thing or not i know one other thing julie and i spoke about is um it's been a little more rushed in some of these online meetings with a little less time for kind of the personal touch which is one thing that in some of these questions came out that people kind of miss um, from the PAC uh, meeting in person, the ability to have that chit chat before a meeting or after a meeting, and it might not necessarily stretch out the meeting more, but it, that time is just there, whereas online it might not be as much. So um, I don't know if there's a reaction to that at all. You know, I mean, I think um, your point regarding standardization, both in st start time and duration, is well taken. I think, you know, four to six can be is a fine schedule. Um, but, um, you know, I do think that if you have an hour and 45 minutes of material, it will be two hours um, just because there's no need to keep it moving as much. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because, as you say, um, you know, we sort of we don't have the, you know, the pleasure of getting together and, you know, walking to a bar afterwards or this kind of thing. So to make even sort of a de minimis substitution for that, maybe maybe the answer is to, you know, not start promptly at, you know, one minute after the hour, but maybe, you know, 12 minutes after the hour. I mean, just not, you know, so I, I get what you're saying and I'm not opposed to having it two hours, but. Um, regard, I think just things necessarily fill the time allotted. You know, I don't think the expectation should be like, well, you know, an hour and 25, you know, an hour and 25 minutes where it's going to end. I don't think it will generally. I think it generally will go to uh, to fill the time allotted. But at least that's the meetings at the firm. They always seem to take, you know, we've got to get out of here till 430. It, it will go till 430 regardless. That's just Maybe we have bad meetings. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that, Christopher. I'll just throw in. I I also don't want to make it seem like I'm ab I like I'm advocating. I think you all should kind of. I, I want to hear from you all right now. As far as the the you know the the interpersonals and interstitials, um, I th just this format is what I think is is a bigger stifler to that. You know, to, just the things that we're accustomed to being in person or all, all in the same room and moving around before and after. Um, I don't, I don't, and I don't know if anybody's saying it, but I don't think the length of the meeting is going to uh, really overcome what the technology is kind of prevents from happening. Um, to push back on that, Peter, um, I've been in other meetings and talking to a lot of people um, about who are doing meetings like this and i'm hearing a fair amount of variation in how effective these can be and a lot of what i'm hearing about what's effective is giving space for introductions and maybe like almost making them a bit more like first grade so that there's um ways for some social back and forth to happen some reminder that we're all you know just kind of uh, you know muddling through this and i I don't think it can make up for the being in person, but at least I haven't been in one that's great, but I, I do think that there's more mm -hmm. space that we had to push that. Um, and I saw Barb hand up and then Abigail's, and I don't mean to keep to rebuttal you or anything, Peter, and then not give you a chance. <laughs> not at all, uh, not, a, not at all. I'm, I'm open to any kind of techniques that, uh, that uh, could facilitate those things. But yes, go, so who would you say Abigail? And I, I see Abigail first, and then Abigail. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I really don't have a question, more of a comment. And I think that uh, this format doesn't is more challenging when we have challenging topics because we're not in the same room. We're not. We can't see each other's faces in the same way. We can't read body language, and so it's harder to talk about hard things in this format. 
And I'm not sure there's any way to fix that in this format because we are working on a split screen. I do, I don't have any problem with the meetings going two hours. I mean, I'm, but I'm retired. And I I can set my schedule pretty much as I want. I have other meetings that I do, but they don't conflict with this. And um, so I like that. But I know that other people have either jobs that they have to get to, they have to stay until they get here at 4.30 because they leave their job, or they have families that they want to get home to. But um, I personally think that this has gone as well as it could go given the challenging issues that this city has faced and we have faced as a committee over the last year and will be facing continuously with climate and um, trials coming up that will incite everybody's feelings. I, I mean, I think these are difficult times and we have to understand that and maybe a little bit more time to just talk to each other ahead of time would give us, we would relax a little bit and remember each other in a different way. So. Thanks, Barb. Appreciate that. Um, Abigail. Yes. First of all, snaps for Barb because I think she she really just highlighted everything everybody's been thinking. Um, so thank you, Barb. I really appreciate everything you're saying. I was like, yes, that and that too. Um, <laughs> I like the idea of uh, social time and I like the idea of meetings. Um, and then I kind of wanted to hit on the idea of like starting every meeting at four. I do think the tapered time as minimal as it is, a half an hour is helpful for anyone who wants to attend the subcommittee meeting and actually attending the full is even more difficult because it's earlier. Um, so I didn't know if I could propose that maybe, I mean, this is up to Millicent, whoever's running the meeting on actual teams is that the content of subcommittees always starts at 4.30, but the meeting opens at 4.15 for 15 minutes of social time. So that like, if you want social time, you can come at 4.15 or four or however we set that as an idea. But then like, if you wanna just log in and do the meeting, you can come at 4.30 uh, and the meeting is only a half an hour. Um, and then in that way, we get the social time if we want it, but then we also have a meeting start time and it's still an hour and a half and i don't know i just I'd like and maybe that's just for subcommittees full committee meetings we could always discuss you know opening them a little early or um something like that and then also with the recording situation then we could like we're not recording the social time that comes maybe like after or something Absolutely. so i agree i agree with that that makes a lot of sense and we we have, talked, ready. we have talked about that in the in an executive call where we I, I talked to Chris and told him and I was supposed to bring that up in the section, Abigail and Millicent. Was it, we had discussed that and it sounded like it might work, but were we rolling it out with the first full or were we discussing it further in the first full? I think it's a good idea to start at least 15 minutes early. I'm open to starting it a half an hour early. If you guys want to get together and just, you know, you can open the meeting. I'm we usually just, there 10 minutes early and we're chatting. Yeah, <laughs> we, me and Barb and Peter usually start chatting a little bit. You guys. <laughs> it, yeah. It'd be it'd be fun to have like like lighthearted topics that change every time too. So it's like, you know, something to like, I don't know. Talk Maybe about. cribbage. Like, yeah, cribbage or like a favorite to you. I don't know, something. <laughs> something to like make it make it look forward to, you know. Uh -huh. One of the things that oh. I, I am concerned about is that we have really well-intentioned people who come in and present us projects that are probably not what they're wanting to design. It's not like there's this almost inbuilt antagonism because we're dealing with such a car-centric um, culture and institutions. And it's like it, my only qualm about meeting before is that it helps us as a group, but it doesn't help with necessarily the people coming in um, from other agencies or the presenters who we also never see their faces because they're doing the presentations. So I, I miss that, like the way that we can hold people accountable really firmly for the design they're showing us while also acknowledging that we, you know, we know they're doing their best within this broken system too. <laughs> yeah, I I guess the, the one thing, um, I, we do ask a lot of presenters time already. So, I mean, we, we can, we can invite people. We can let people know that there's like an early time. And like, if, if, if a given presenter wants to join in the, on that and like see the PAX lighter side before 
the real issues come out. <laughs> um, I, 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 it may be something that's just a little harder to get um, over over the. the yeah, I totally room, but... I I miss that, and that felt like it's a it's a difficult piece even in person because it can feel so tense, and they feel like they're defending you know this the, the thing they've been working on for so long that they're doing their best at, and we're coming at it from you know it just it's a fraught point and I want them to take us seriously knowing that we're all on the same side. Cause I really don't think most of them are coming in trying to design um, terrible things. It's just a terrible system we're in. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, like you were saying, like even in in-person meetings, that was never really guaranteed that we could have that soft, you know, like way of just chatting with them and, you know, um, feeling on their side or getting them aligned or, you know, talking to them after. So I, I just, I think, online meetings are never going to be perfect. So what can we do to just make them like as good as we can make them? And that might just be, we open 15 minutes early to have chats, even just among the five of us who show up or something. Um, is that something that we could like put on the agenda? So it's like there, or if it's on the agenda, does it have to be recorded? I don't know what the rules are. Yeah, no, we, we wouldn't want to put that on the official agenda, um, but, okay. but we, we could, I, I I think I think we should just make it more of almost like a word of mouth, like just do a thing. I don't think we're doing anything like wrong or illegal. If we if we put it on the agenda, that's public. That's public notice. Like that that becomes like a different thing. But if, if we just get together early, I think that's totally fine. And the link will work. And yeah. Millicent, I like you and I can talk about it if we want to like trade off on set we can who, just open who gets it up. in or. Whatever yeah. to let people in the lobby and stuff like that, but I'm I'm happy to do that too. And it, it sounds like like a lot of people like it on this call at least. Yeah. So maybe we'll make an announcement at the full meeting uh, next week. Uh, that that we, like I'll make an announcement at the end that we're going to start 15 minutes early, 20 like 20 minutes. What do we think is comfortable? For those who've been arriving early, how's it been going? Like. Uh, well, I just usually sign on at about 10 minutes before the meeting because I don't want to have trouble getting on. So then I'm there and usually Millicent's there and then occasionally Peter comes and Chris shows up and then we just talk and just like we did if I because I used to always get to the meetings early too and I'd see Neil or somebody else would be there and um, that's what that's my experience. I do it mostly so that I don't have a struggle to be late. But and Neil doesn't come early anymore now that he can just sit in his living room. No, he doesn't. Ah, how lazy. <laughs> Mostly because I don't know what the... <laughs> I'm always running around the square. Yeah. Um, I barely get into the meeting as time as it is. Maybe it's my linear sequential brain that really wants this, but if we're going to, we're moving the meeting times that they all be four o'clock rather than than uh, four and 4.30. Um, I, I don't know. I have are, you, are, are you saying for the early for the early start, Peter? No, for the for the official for the official start. If we're changing, if we're if we're going to change these, you know, we're, if we're looking at changing the segments of the segment time of the meetings in particular, that there's that that we make it a everything be four to six rather than a set of four to six, and then a set of four thirty to six thirties. I think we're keeping them four thirty to six. Why? Well, well, Set I, the beginning. Why did we set 4:30 for subcommittees and four o'clock for the main group? Was there a reason? Let's go back. It's, it's been that way since I've been here. Um, I don't know, it Matthew, just, if you were there. Yeah, it, there there isn't a reason other than you know it has changed a little bit over my five and a half six years. It's, it's just kind of been up to the committee, the committees themselves. It used to be that everything was at four, but, but I, I don't. Slack ever changed? Um, I think perhaps before your time. I wait. I I guess you were here a couple months before. I came in July, and you came in in February. Of the same year of 2015. Yeah. Oh, I think. So oh, okay. The same year. Okay. So it's been that could be pretty. The back, the back seems to have switched more. Yeah, I think you're right. Actually, and I've definitely shown up. I've shown up late to the full pack because I get the four four thirty confused, and remember while I'm walking and can't go any faster. <laughs> That's when you hop on a bus. It is. <laughs> but when Sorry. When to Nicollet, Nicollet buses don't do you any speed good. Once you like, oh, once I'm in Nicollet, I'm as fast as buses downtown. Just pass, 
Just pay an extra dollar and ask them to go to break the speed limit. Just <laughs> step on it. That works for me a lot. So wait, just to double check, I, I understood the conversation to be going that we would keep the 430 for the subcommittees and start early. Is that? I think there's, it's different for I and E where we actually sometimes have to go longer. So I don't quite know where that one's at, but it sounds like at least for P and P, rolling in a little early for a 430 start makes sense. Okay. That makes um, sense for P and P. But I and E sort of, that's the one where we sometimes end up with a crunch and not being giving projects as much attention as they deserve because we just have so many sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it was it was kind of two things being talked about together at once that don't necessarily have to be decided in this in the same way. And, and, and I'll take a, I was thinking about this earlier today. It's like it's a little hard and that's why I didn't want to make any full on decisions today. I think the decision about doing something before the meeting, like we can make that decision. That's just like an mm -hmm. added thing. Let's do that. The decision about the meeting times. Personally, I feel like if if we are going to take the jump to do that, I'd rather do like another uh, anonymous survey or a full pack vote. Um, oh, yeah. So, so that it's not like, yeah, mm -hmm. could, could, uh, yeah, voices get different weights at different times, depending on who's there and all, all that. Sort For of sure. Stuff. But, so so uh, Peter, I, I heard you say basically uh, advocate a little bit for the standardization, but it sounds like there's some kind of um, disagreement amongst the group which is totally fine um so i don't know we can we can we could bring that up like that doesn't have to be decided right now either we can bring that up as we report this out at the full and see if kind of more strong thoughts come out um or if it is still just kind of i think if we're going to make any decision on time changes it should coincide with new people coming in before they come in not directly after they come in so i'd say like in july when we're all like up for new terms or you know terms are at a halfway mark that would be a good time so maybe we can make the decision now or early on so that come july like everybody knows what's going on and also the new people are like prepared for that i don't know that just feels to me more appropriate if we're going to change times yeah okay but yeah yeah. All right, we're coming up on on uh, on uh, on six to uh, six o'clock. Yeah. So I, do we have I, a, I do we have a? Oh, sorry, Peter. I would just say that. So we're, we're taking that we're taking the, uh, this discussion to the full to the full pack in in February. Yeah. Is that right? Um, there, there are some other questions that I didn't really go through on the survey. I don't I don't think we really need to. Frankly, um, this was the main discussion I was hoping to have. So I think this is. Um, Good, and we can take this and run to the full pack with it. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. All right, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Chris. Group high five. So high five, five everybody. Hey. Uh, well, well, we have, we have, we have Abigail, Terry. Abigail, Julia. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. everyone. Bye. Good one. Bye. bye. Where are we? 359 in per.